Hey, it's Christian Stevenson, a.k.a. DJ Barbecue, and you are listening to United Q Podcast. Listen to all the raddest people in the world of live fire cooking. These guys are hitting on them. And if you want to find me, uh, go to Facebook, DJ Barbecue. I'm also on Instagram as DJ Barbecue. Twitter is DJ underscore Barbecue, or just put DJ BBQ into YouTube, and you'll see our channel, 138,000 subscribers, number two channel on YouTube. But you can't touch the barbecue pit, boys, because they're good. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Dan from United Q. It's Wednesday, which means we have another awesome podcast to get you over hump day. I'm here with my co-host, Barbecue Forte. Hello. And we are brought to you by ProQ, a barbecue gourmet and smoke with Jack, our awesome sponsors. ProQ is dedicated to providing you with quality smoking products with top-notch service and free advice for beginners to pit masters. And you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under ProQ Smokers. So if you think about buying your first smoker or looking to upgrade or even looking to pick up some epic accessories, check them out over at Max Barbecue. And Barbecue Gourmet is devoted to promoting real barbecue and supplying the UK and Europe with top championship winning barbecue rubs, sauces, marinades and accessories from the US and around the world. And you can find them on Twitter and online under Barbecue Gourmet. So regardless of how you cook, whether it's on charcoal, wood, gas or electric, the real taste of barbecue can be yours all year round. And on today's show, we have DJ Barbecue, Christian. Hi, Christian. Hey, guys. How's it going? Yeah, really good, man. I'm just marinating some meat at the moment and, uh, and just warmed up a shepherd's pie. I did a smoked lamb shanks uh, shepherd's pie last week, and um, I shot nine videos. So I've got a lot of food left over, so I'm trying to get through it without overeating, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I can imagine that's quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, just, we're just trying to come up with content and, and, and videos, and, and then there's just always lots of food. So I always like tell friends, come stay with me if you have to work in London, and, and I just feed people. You know, I go, what do you fancy? I got some, uh, some Alabama white sauce, uh, you know, grilled chicken in there. I've got some skirt steak. I've got some candy pork tenderloin. I got a shepherd's pie. And my friends are like, are you kidding me? You know, no one's got this kind of, you know, food for us. And it's all leftovers, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd well, now we all know where to move list, when, yeah. we, when we live in London. Yeah, yeah come, come stay with me, man. I'll yeah. feed you. <laughs> I'm, awesome. a, I'm a feeder. <laughs> I'm a year. So. <laughs> Good. We're going to get along, man. Yeah. <laughs> so coming up with all of those ideas for different recipes and stuff, do you just think up ideas and then go out there and try them out, or have you got someone else coming up with ideas and stuff as what well? What inspires you to do these things? It's a lot of traveling, really. That's how you, that's mainly it. You go travel, like we just did a, like a, 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 we went to Portugal, no, so we went to Brazil for a week with Giles Corn of the Times, shooting this grill to, uh, Finding Grilltopia series for Hellman's. Then we, we did a road trip from, Nash, so from Nashville to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and I got to hook up with all my favorite pit masters like Peg Leg in Nashville and Pat Martin who does Whole Hog. There's not many Whole Hog guys out there anymore. And then we went up into the Smoky Mountains and I cooked up in there. And then we did uh, went off the beaten path to a place called Santi, South Carolina. And it's proper down-home cooking, everything from scratch, proper Carolina chops pork. And the guy's cooking picnic and, and pork butt in the whole shoulder. Uh, everything's from scratch, and it's like a buffet style, $12.95, including tax for all like banana pudding, hash and rice, like proper grandma down home cooking. And then we hooked up with Home Team, who just opened up their third restaurant. And I'm going to say it right now, top three best barbecue in the world. We'll go for it then. Name, name the other two. <laughs> we got Home, t- home Team. Now go. The so other home, team, home Team uh, are top three. Um, Tyson Ho uh, up in Bushwick, he's the arrogant swine. He also does whole hog, um, and he does what's called outside brown, which is something I never heard of. It's a, it's an off menu item that you get in Western Carolina, and it's like the burnt ends of the pig world. And and I had that awesome. there, and it was incredible. And he doesn't he doesn't plug in any of his smokers. He's like me, man. You know, he babysits his cookers. He has a guy coming in at eleven and babysits them all night. You know, awesome. like proper. You know, you know, and, and, and if you have a restaurant, you have to get an oiler or old hickory or something. Right? You know, I'll I'll probably have to go that way too. But at the moment, I like using my langs, and I think I get a good wood smoke flavor. And but it is it is heat maintenance, and there's no dials, there's no plug-ins. It's just fuel, you know, oxygen flow, and man. And, yeah, back and the old heat. school naked style cooking, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and I and I respect people that do that style of cooking. Uh, Pat Martin does a bit of that with his whole hog. 
Um, you know, he cooks he cooks the coals in the, in the big fireplace, then moves them under the pig, and same with peg leg. And it's just it, I like seeing you know the old school way of cooking and um and get ideas. You know, like right now I'm doing a um Korean uh, Philadelphia cheesesteak, so I'm doing like a bulgogi uh, kind of sweet meat rest, uh, marinade with Asian pears, and that's marinating now on some skir- some uh, sirloin and some ribeyes. And then I'm going to do a Philadelphia cheesesteak, but with this Korean twist. And I'm shooting a video on Friday for the new Homefront video game for that. Awesome. Wow. So you're going to have some Philly <laughs> cheesesteak sandwiches for leftovers tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to do some tonight, man. My friend's coming. I'm, you know, i got to experiment, you know. So uh, awesome. I'm just going to knock out some uh, some Korean Philadelphia cheesesteaks. It's like doing a Korean burrito, a corrido, you know. <laughs> <laughs> corrido. <laughs> So do you often do you practice them quite a few times before you shoot the video for it? Yeah, I, the, the 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 smoked lamb shanks I've been working on in a while. I've been working on the smoked lamb shanks for a couple of years, and um, when I was happy with that, then I started. I think I I cooked uh, the shepherd's pie with the smoked lamb shanks twice to make sure I got it all right, and then I did it and I did it on camera last week. So that's being edited right now. So that'll probably go up soon. It's a it's an ambitious recipe because you know the smoking of the lamb shanks can take anywhere between two and four hours, depending on how hot your heat is and how big the shanks are. Um, and then you got to make the big sauce. And I made a bone marrow stock that I used as the base of the, st- of the sauce. Um, I've been, uh, during the winter, because it was just cold in London, I just I just roasted bones <laughs> and, just, and just made loads of stock. So now I'm just pulling them all out and utilizing them. And uh, there's nothing better than a good bone marrow stock. It's just yeah, it just gives you know chilies and and stews and and um, and shepherd's pie another depth of flavor. Awesome. Yeah, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I know you've got sometimes the... sometimes I don't I can't experiment too much because I, one I don't have time. So a lot of times I'll just I'll see I'll envision the recipe in my head. You know I know the flavors will work and I'll just do it right away for the first time on camera. So there's a couple of those on my YouTube channel. So yeah, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So on the road, you're using the uh, the offset stick burner a lot. Uh, what what do you cook on at home? Uh, what do I call my smoker at home? And what do you cook on at home? What what smokers do you use at home? Is it an offset at home or? No, well, because I've just moved to London, um, I've got three offsets. I've got a Lang 108, which is like you know the biggest smoker Lang make, and I can I can cook about 57 to 62 pork butts at a time. I mean, it's a beast. Um, they, ben Lang calls it the intimidator, the man who made it because it intimidates a lot of guys because he can get away from you because <laughs> the firebox is so big. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that made its debut at Meatopia a couple years ago. I still need to get that on wheels. But my main cooker um, is Della, and that's a 60-inch reverse flow Lang offset with a, 42, with a 40-inch grill. It's all in a boat trailer. It's getting redone right now. It's getting rebuilt um, to go with our new food truck. It's like we, we built this new catertainment truck that's got speakers that come out of hydraulics. We can properly cater to Um and then I've got a I've got a thirty six inch Lang, which is my practice smoker, but that's still at my old house. because um, the thing is even though it's a small smoker, it doesn't fit into any gates. You know, it's yeah. so because de- it's American and they're just so wide and because it's roll quarter inch steel, it's such a you know, hefty unit. You know, it's so heavy. Um and you can't lift it up. So uh, that's uh, right now, I'm just using a Drumbecue, uh, the 57 um, centimeter uh, Weber kettle, and then I've got a, I guess, got a pit barrel centimeter. I've been doing my smoked lamb shanks on, so that's that's been really useful. Awesome. Yeah, cool. those are my, those are my three cookers at the moment, in a very in a very small courtyard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Most people are dying for outside space. You're filling the outside space with barbecues, so. Well, barbecues and pinball. So if you go. A bit further, there's a little garage there, and I've got an NBA fast break that I play there. Um, yeah, I imported from Poland because uh, they don't know how much those things are worth, so I um, imported it for like well, half the price of what it is worth. I'm a, I'm a, that's one of my kind of that's, that's I think one of my main hobbies other than barbecue is um, is uh, pinball. Awesome, cool. <laughs> yeah. And what, what sort of fuels then are the offsets you use? And obviously they're stick burners, but do you use a tip, Do you use a particular wood or are you using yeah. coals for the temperature, and then you use the wood for the smoke, or? I, I think I well in the beginning because I'm I'm I want to get wood smoke flavoring for the first four to five hours on a, on a pork shoulder, so I wanted to get that mahogany color. So I'll start with sweet woods like cherry, cherry and apple, 
and then I'll, I'll mix in some sweet chestnuts. I like the flavors you get off sweet chestnut. And then I might put, put a couple oaks in there just because they're hard warning burn you know, the hardwoods and they really burn for a long time but they can also overpower so you got to be careful with with oak um and so I'll, I'll kind of go you know stick burner for the first five hours then i think the, the uk's taste for wood smoke is they don't want too much and and if you go to a lot of places in america they, they cook their wood first so um you know cooking with wood i mean that's you get a lot of that in texas um so i don't want to overpower it so once i get the ma- mahogany color I pull these huge, you know, 4.5 4. to 5.5 kilo pork butts out. Um, and I've got them done, you know, American spec, uh, blade bone in. I, I get the chine bone, neck bone removed. Um, and, of course, I get rid of the rind and the fat cap. And I just, you know, want that, that rub to really, you know, oxidize with the meat and the smoke to create that good pink ring. Yeah, um, and then once I pull them, then I'll double wrap them in foil or butcher paper, and I'll hit them with some cider vinegar and apple juice, maybe some you know pineapple juice if I'm getting a bit frisky, because um, that helps <laughs> tenderize the meat. And then I loosely wrap it, and then I let it go all night. And, w- and then that's when I add oak and charcoal, like the big kind of um, the, the, I, I add big, I, I save all my big chunks of charcoal, and then I get those uh, those magic sticks that Mark Parr makes. Yeah. And, um, cause they're really efficient. So I just load the firebox up and then I, I babysit it, you know, I keep it about two, three, five, two fifty Fahrenheit, you know, around one ten, one fifteen Celsius. And then right before, um, it's time to go to bed. I just load the firebox up. I close all the holes. I rock it to 300, uh, Fahrenheit. And then I just let it slow cook. And then by the time I get back, there'll still be some members in there and it'll be down to like 100, 150. I get it back to 10 because I can, I got service. So, even though I don't have anybody there babysitting my, my cooker, I'm able to uh, get a couple hours of Z's before um, we have service the next day. Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of knowing your cookers, though. You know your cookers. You've cooked with them a lot of times, so you know you can use it and then hit the sack and wake up and know where it's going to be. And that's the beauty yeah. of, of getting to know your, your cooker. That, well, that, that's it. Everybody, everybody says they're frustrated. They can't light their fires. They have, they're having a hard time maintaining tap. And I'm like, just get to know your cooker. I mean, it, you know. I'm still getting to know the nuances of my Lang, even though I've been cooking on her for, you know, six years. But she just gets better. You know, that's the beauty. I mean, that, the beauty with a Lang, you know, when you get these, you know, roll quarter-inch steel smokers, offsets, they're, they're family heirlooms, you know, because there's yeah, so much forever. sweet smoke and flavor in those walls, and they will last forever. You just got to maintain the firebox. But, you know, other than that, you know, you know, sand them down, give them a lick of paint, you know, uh, heat-resistant paint every year. And clean them, keep them clean, get rid of that ash. You're, you're, you know, you're going to be good to go. And that's why the build quality on these things are so good. I mean, you've even seen people now like picking up the the retro webbers that they find. And the, we were talking about like, the kettle barbecues now, and like the ones they find on the sides of the road, and they're and they're retrofitting them and cleaning them up, and they're they're cooking like they're brand new, and they're like 30, 40, 50 years old. These these Weber kettles they're picking up. So some of the some of the quality of the barbecues you can pick up, you, you pick one of these brands, Weber Pro-Q, I mean anything like that they just they just last forever the the old the old webers are phenomenal uh a friend of mine chris taylor who is my griller on tour he's actually the master chef food economist and i've been working with him closely on a lot of stuff and you know he, he's got a couple new webers for the is this hellman's thing and then he got an old weber that's like you know 15 years old and i look at that and i go that looks that that looks dope i mean that you know it's got a couple of dents in it but you know it's solid and, and, you know, whenever, cause I go through a lot of Weber's, I cook so much, but I, I, you know, I was, the only thing that goes on, I'm not the kettle at all. It's just the, um, it's the ash catcher, you know, that catches all the ash Yeah. that kind of gets melted and it gets mangled. And then I just, I just, I handed, you know, I handed on to another person, but I wish I kept my very first Weber because that was that 18 inch one. Um, and it just, I could get so much food on it. Yeah. It had really high profile. So it worked for like getting big joints of meat in there. And um, and it just it was solid, and and that's why, like you said, it's always cool to to see these guys picking up old Weber's and and retrofitting them, and just you know sandblasting them and get, getting them back in use, giving them a new lease of life. Yeah, there's there's a team in there. It's at like the Weber Weber Collectors Club in 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 Oz, and they're they're rocking up to all the competitions with like a display of like forty, fifty like vintage Weber's and all the vintage colors and everything. It looks so cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I, is, are they on instagram can i follow them yeah let yeah, me try and find them let yeah. me try and find them for you i'll give you the Sick. i'll give you the name in a minute i'm a i'm a big fan of weber i did my i um cooked my entire 
a book on a Weber. I think I did a couple of the recipes in my Lang, but for the most part, I just try to like make things relatable and just did everything on a Weber, even the slow cook stuff. Yeah, I think when I first was getting into barbecue, it was watching some of your videos with you cooking on the Weber. It's like I could see how versatile this is, and I could do so many different things with it from watching you yeah. do so many different things. So it's a great thing for people to start out with, I think. As long as you're setting it up for indirect cooking, you, you, you're goof-proofing yeah. your, your your food. You know, you're goof-proofing your cooking, and and I and I mean, I, I don't think I ever just lay charcoal over the whole thing. I always go half and half, or Death Star technique, or I'll do like a target or a bullseye. I mean, I have all these different techniques, and but I've always got an indirect zone. I've always got a yeah. safe zone I can go to um, in case things get out of hand. You know, because. You know, meat's got fat, and when fat you know hits fire, you know you can get those crazy flare-ups. If you got marinades going and a lot of oils, so you know, just I think if people can just remember to to, to set up for indirect, you know, you're going to be a lot happier. You get better results, and and you can make sure you're cooked all the, you're cooked all the way through as well. You know, you turn that outdoor grill into an outdoor oven with that lid. Weber's a very versatile cooker, and do you look at drum cue? They make great cookers, and they're made in England. They're made in London. You know, we should be supporting, you know, locally made cookers. And that's that's the beauty of this whole smoking, grilling, barbecue phenomenon that's just really escalated over the past five years in the UK is just the proliferation of smokers, the people that want to get into smoking and, and grilling meat and realizing that live fire is so is so it's is another ingredient, you know. It's 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 like your marinades, it's like your rubs, it's like you know, there's no there's no flavor in gas and electricity. There's a, there's flavor in wood, and 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 if you're making fresh charcoal, and or if you cook your charcoal at different temperatures, you can retain some of that wood moisture and some of the gas in there that will impart flavor onto the food. Definitely, we had like a wicked charcoal yeah. tutorial from Matt Williams from the Oxford Charcoal Company. He was on the show a few weeks ago and and like blew our minds with his his like. It's Jedi mind tricks with the, yeah, the charcoal. Amazing knowledge of charcoal. Is like, Dude, oh, me, he's like a crazy Matt's, scientist. I think one of the smart, he, he's one of the smartest humans in the world. Like when Tyson Ho from Arrogant Swine in New York, um, like he's the only guy in the North doing whole hog. When he met Matt, he goes, that is the most intelligent man I've ever met. But Matt, you know, Matt went to Oxford. He was a Thatcher for 20 years. And he, I don't know if you guys know this, but Matt is my firebox manager. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. Told us that. Yeah, he's telling us. <laughs> could could you could you have a better firebox manager? Definitely not. <laughs> no way. Me, I, my crew looks like Lord of the Rings. You know, I've got my <laughs> Hobbit firebox manager, Matt Williams. I've got uh, Chris Taylor, who looks like Gandalf's nephew before he goes gray. He's grilling a, a thousand burgers on the on the on the Lang grill. Um, he's blind by three or four o'clock, but he just drinks cider to get through it. And then <laughs> he work? takes his clothes off and starts the party. Yeah. I mean, and he cooks these burgers to perfection. They're, they're, they're medium. And when you bite into them, they're super juicy. You know, it's a seven ounce brisket flank chuck blend. And if I get naughty, I might put some bone marrow in there. And he cooks these things perfect. Awesome. Damn. <laughs> just so hungry now. <laughs> you guys, you guys got to come to one of our hookups, man. Yeah, we, come we'll see us at Grill Stock. Yeah, we'll I, think be there. I, I think we're doing full beef legs. We're going to do two beef legs on an 11 foot spit. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. We, we won't make any money on it, but yeah. it'll look sick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to taste awesome. Yeah. So you're going to have a big spit setup then at, at Grill Stock this year? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're So, Chris, my. um. The guy who does my grilling, the guy from MasterChef, he's his mad engineer as well. His mom is one of the first home economists in this country. She did Ready, Steady, Cook. Him and her work on Great British Menu and MasterChef. And he just loves heavy metal and, 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 and live fire. So we get on like that. We, we get on great. So he, he showed me this spit that he built, and he had these huge beef legs on there. And I'm like, man, you imagine taking this to, to, to festivals. He, we did the numbers. I'm like, we're not going to make any money. I go, but who gives a shit? It's going to look so damn cool. And, and you know, that's part of grill stock, you know. You, you want to show off and get people stoked on live fire cooking. Yeah. You're, I loved your little, uh, it's like your DJ desk as the barbecue as well. You need to get, yeah, we, you need to get some smoke barbecue. coming out of that or something, do you? I know. Well, no, I, get, I need to get a hazer uh, yeah. and, and hook. Yeah, that's, I've, been, I've been threatening I'll put a hazer on there for like three years. But yeah, maybe this is the year that I... <laughs> I get the smoke machine for the, for that cooker, yeah. but we're, we're doing more vinyl this time, so I can't fit the vinyl decks in there. Uh, um, 
but we, yeah, we, we always find that we, when we play vinyl, we get a much warmer, cool party vibe. Um, cause people, it, again, it's kind of like the old school smoking, you know, you use these offset firebox stick burners and then you, and you play vinyl. It's all kind of more analog, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's make it more authentic. <laughs> yeah. Well there's, well, there's just no, you're not plugged in, although you are plugged in with vinyl, but you just, it just <laughs> feels warmer. You know, there's, it's not made of zeros and ones, you know, and you know, you're not, you're not running your, your cooker, your smoker with your iPhone and an app, you know, you're. You know, it's it's just it's just it's real. last year our our temp it is our, our last year our, our temperature gauges broke on the Lang and we didn't we just kind of knew by smell and by feel mm. and by by hearing what was happening with you know the breakdown of the collagen and you could hear it happening you could feel it you could smell it and that's how we ran the smoker was through those senses not even reading numbers because they didn't work <laughs> at the beginning that's of- getting. Go on. So, Go ahead. As I say, no, at the beginning of this bit, you um you mentioned Grilltopia and working with Hellman's. What's what's that yeah. about? You've not you've not, to, you've not Yeah, let's dive into that. that. <laughs> so that is a it's a we're, it's a whole bunch of series that we're doing with taking people out of their comfort zone. Uh, so in England, we took a West Country farmer who's a traditional lamb farmer. You know, takes him to, takes him to hog it. You know, so they taste the lamb tastes like it should. They he feeds his lamb on on ground ivy, red clover, um, you know, buttercup, you know, really good foliage. And and he doesn't intensively farm them. And he's never been to London before. So we took him to London. He never had jerk chicken, never had any spice. He never had, it, like, you know, anything from South, South African kind of barbecue, all these different kind of vibes. Went over and saw Josh Cass, Josh Cass, who does the, the cauliflower shawarma. And he uses wood smoke and grilling properties to impart flavors on that. And this guy was blown away. You know, I took him to see Mark Parr's, you know, what, what Mark's doing with wood notes on, on, on flavor. That was the first show. Then we took a burger flipper to Paris, see what they're doing. That took Giles Corn to, to Brazil. And we went down to the border of Uruguay and I went cattle herding. And the one thing I, I love what the Brazilians do about with barbecue, but they, they, I know it's just coming into fruition, but they don't really dry age over there. Like they killed the cow two days before I got there. Um, but yeah. I love that just due to refrigeration and power, you know, it's hard to, to dry age and, and maintain a good temperature in, in these other countries. So they slaughtered the cow two days before we got there. And then, you know, they, they hacked up these huge beef ribs, Costellos, and then they, we made a fire and just slammed the ribs next to the fire. And, you know, it was great, you know, made feijoada and, and Giles Corn was perfect because he hates Portuguese food. So he was, I always, I, I want to take someone out of the comfort zone. And then we went to Cal, to America in that road trip from Nashville to, to Charleston with Cupcake Gemma, who's one of the food tube, uh, you know, artisans mm-hmm. that's blown up. She's our biggest star on that channel. She's about to hit 700,000 subscribers. And, um, so it's just trying, it's just finding Grilltopia, getting people into live fire cooking. And, um, and it, it, they promote. They promoted it on um, Britain's Got Talent uh, two Saturdays ago. The sixty-second ad, um, which is pretty ambitious for uh, for Hellman's. I was really stoked on that. Yeah, awesome. I saw some adverts for it this morning on a bus shower as I was driving through Plymouth. Really? Yeah. Big wow, I got, I got, I got, Hellman's band board. I'll take a photo and I'll send it to you. <laughs> nice. Well, they're, they're um they got a whole range of sauces coming out. It's funny because. You know, Hellman's are, you know, they're doing mustard, they're doing barbecue sauces, and they're really good. And then you've got, you got, you know, the competitors now doing, like Heinz now are doing the mayonnaise. You know, they they all want a bit of that market. And, you know, ketchup rules. And, mm-hmm. and Heinz make, you know, the best ketchup. You know, you don't mess with it. And to me, Hellman's make the best mayonnaise. And mm-hmm. I could make my own, but I like to taste the Hellman's. So, uh, you know, and, and now I'm all into Alabama white sauce. Once I discovered that, man, I, I'm just all the time making my own versions of Alabama white sauce. Big Bob Gibson won Mem- Memphis in May, I don't know how many years ago, doing that sauce. And it's just, you know, the mayonnaise, vin- cider vinegar-based sauce. It's killer on chicken and pork. Is that, is that it? Just just mayo and cider vinegar, or is there a bit more to it? Or? Yeah, there's a little bit more to it. So a lot of pepper, cracked pepper. Um, I put a little dash of hot sauce in there, some Worcester sauce, um, and lemon juice. Awesome. And then you, you, you can always play with your profiles. Everybody's got different versions, you know, a bit of onion granules, sometimes some garlic granules. Um, but it's really cider vinegar and mayonnaise, you know, a bit of lemon juice and uh, Worcester and, and, and lots of cracked pepper. 
and you've got a really good sa- sauce, maybe there's salt in there as well. And you just dip it. You can double dip, but you got to be careful you don't hit it too hot because you can split your sauce. So the key is a lot of times what Bob Gibson does, he'll take the whole yard bird out and then he just dunks it into these white sauce buckets. And because the bird's still hot, it cooks that sauce in. You know what I mean? Mm. But that's like my new favorite sauce. Awesome. I'm going to give it a go. Mm. Do it. It's easy. There's so many recipes on the web, man. But if you just think a cup of, of, of mayonnaise, to three-fourths of a cup of cider vinegar because you don't want it thick. You want it really loose and liquidy. Okay. And then some lemon juice for more tang. It's all about tang. My my barbecue's Carolina, uh, and and my family's from, like, the south. My mom's from Virginia Beach, and I like like the vinegar-based kind of vibes on barbecue. Yeah, now you mentioned awesome. that, but I guess we glossed over that. We didn't really talk about like where you're from and where, what your roots are in barbecue. Like where, where did it all begin for you in the barbecue world? My father is from Iowa. My mama's from Virginia Beach. So I grew up uh, fishing and cooking barbecue with my granddaddy um, off the coast of Virginia Beach. So I spent all day out in the Atlantic, you know, catching fish. And then we go and clean up about 200 fish on the way back from uh, the shipyard. Uh, he, we would just drop off fish, you know, freshly caught spots and croakers to friends and family, and they would give us bread, freshly baked bread, some fruit and veg, maybe some meat. And we would have a barter on the way home. You know, everybody got fresh fish. And then we would do these, these clam bakes and barbecues and fish fries. And, and that's where I, a lot of my love of food came from was that side of the family. But my grandpa, my dad's father, man, that guy cooks barbecue. Like, he, he would just take his kids to, to like, state parks in the Dakotas and he would just break out the bar, you know, the cooker, the grill, and he would have like three chickens on a rotisserie, racks of ribs, sauces going. Uh, he would do full uh, chuck joints and, and do pulled chuck with grandpa sauce. And, and he taught my dad how to cook barbecue. So when I was um, eight years old and my, my parents divorced and I, I got kidnapped twice in, uh, in one year, my mom kidnapped me and my dad kidnapped me back and I got, I was in the courts with this crazy court case, and then my father ended up winning, winning us, which is like unheard of in the 70s. And here he is. Here's a, here's a guy who used to be a, a naval officer, um, communications officer on deck in the Navy. Then he worked for IBM for a bit, and then he quit to work for Hallmark Cards because he had two kids come, he had two kids to raise. And then now he was a single father, and he had these two young kids. He's like, all right, Christian, I need help. Only teach you how to cook barbecue, and from the age of five, you know, he was he had me on the grill, he had me shucking corn because uh, he's an Iowa boy, and you know, I was gr- I was burning burgers, burning dogs, burning steaks, you know, from the age of five to eight until I started getting it right. I think the the most profound moment was when I was cooking some steaks. I think he, you know, he couldn't afford good meat, you know, but it was okay. But it was from the grocery store, and it was it was dry aged, it was you know quite fresh stuff, but. You know, it's what he could afford. And um, we did a lot of flank because flank had good flavor. But um, one time I was doing these sirloins, he, he, you know, he, he went nuts and bought some sirloins. And I was cutting the fat off. And my dad's like, what are you doing? I go, well, you know, there's a bit of gristle and fat here. I'm going to cut it off anyway. So when I'm when I'm going to eat, so I thought I'd do it now. He's like, but Christian, that's where the flavor is. You know, that's good fat. You know, when it's a grass-fed animal, you know, this is good fat. And that's going to flavor the meat. You don't want to cut it off now. Um you want it to caramelize and flavor the meat. And I'm like, ah. So a little revelation when I'm eight, nine years old from my father and then understanding, you know, how fat, you know, can add properties to, to meat. And now you're going through the same thing with your yeah. your uh, your boys, aren't you? You I see loads of pictures of you cooking with your boys. Yeah. They you know, the nine year old, you know, he took a butchery course, learned how to take apart a chicken, make sausages. And he's just so good with tongs. I love watching him with the mallet effect and looking for the, you know, caramelization on, on sausages. He's just, he's a natural. So I'm really trying to, you know, encourage him to do that. Plus my oldest son just got a camera and he's been editing and does after effects. So I thought maybe we could start making some family videos for my channel. I, you know, I, I try to make a, a video every other week or at least every week on my YouTube channel. Um, but it's expensive. You know, I spend, you know, 1200 you know, 1500 quid a month making those videos. And I only get about 200, 300 bucks, you know, in, in ad revenue. So it's a big loss leader for me to impart, to do, but it's doing those videos that, that, you know, brings me to you guys, brings me to Hellman's attention. And, you know, so you got to kind of offset, you know, that cost 
But I also enjoy, you know, doing videos and having the audience ask me, you know, can you do this? Oh, we have this dish in Romania, and I'll do some investigation. And then, you know, I, oh, that's a really good way. You know, everybody's cooked barbecue. All of our ancestors invented barbecue. And barbecue was not invented by the Americans. You know, America is a bunch of immigrants. And, you know, you look at the smoking of brisket, which is an accident, you know, German, Czech, Pole, Pole immigrants in Texas who are smoking their, their sausages and their dogs because, you know, smoke was a way of curing meats and brisket was considered dog meat. They threw brisket next to an open pit, like a salt lit, salt, salt lit kind of pit. And next day it just, you know, breaks down. It's just super tender because all that slow cooking broke down all the connective tissue. So, you know, it's all, Barbecue came from our ancestors because we've only been cooking on gas and electricity for 70 years. Before that, everything was barbecue. So whenever I talk to you, I go, your, your, your family invented barbecue. Everybody's invented barbecue. It's not just an American thing, and that's what I want to get across, that you know, the Turks are incredible with you know, grilling. The Portuguese are the best you know, fish grillers in the world. You know, barbecue comes from all over the planet. I think if you put you know, anything over live fire, that's barbecue. And a lot of people say barbecue is a kind of slow cookie with sauce. I'm going to say anything over live fire, to me, that's barbecue. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm from an uh, Iranian background, and yet me and Ben love, like, your your four, your competition meats, your brisket, your ribs, your chicken, your pork. I mean, we, we love all that, but we also, we're really big on, on like, the sort of worldwide barbecue. And like I said, I, I have Iranian sort of Persian background to me, so I... I've been cooking like kebabs and, and grilling all sorts of meats out out over fire for since I was since I was born. So, so yeah, I have, I have yeah. that sort of connect. And there's so many, like the whole like everyone's like like barbecue is just way way more than what than what anyone thinks it is. And like Ben, a guy called Ben Tish has just brought out an album. Uh, it's not an album. <laughs> it's brought out a uh, a cookbook, and it's a really cool little twist on it. It's like sort of the, your more Mediterranean sort of mm. uh, recipes in there. So it's a lot of sort of yeah. like stuff that you would. I mean, you're on like the sort of south coast of Spain, and, and you just sat on a beach bar somewhere with the the barbecue going outside. I said to him that that was one of the best barbecues I had. Was a guy walking at the beach with some fresh fish that he's just caught, and and then yeah. the guy's just grilling it straight there on on the over the hot coals, and it was it was awesome. And and that's that's the worldwide barbecue there. It's, it's not all about yeah. your, your U.S. style, even though it is awesome, but there is just so much more to it. Well, the, I mean, per, the Persians are phenomenal grillers. The Turks, the you know, every I mean, Eastern Europe, they're all about live fire cooking. I mean, there's a, I'm going to Portugal in a couple of weeks for a little holiday, and um, I'm going to go to Escondidinho, which is a little tiny backyard barbecue joint, and it's just, you know, five skinny oil drums, and the guy has a big bucket of ash. And I'm seeing this a lot more um, with grillers, and he just keeps suffocating his coals. And I always, I know my old world was, you got to keep the coals clean, so you know what you're what you're doing. He's like, no, nah, I don't want an intense heat. I want a good, you know, medium heat. Cause I want, I don't want that gelatin around the the spinal column in the fish. You know, I want to cook it all the way through. I still want a crispy skin. So when I want to get that heat, I just get a metal bar and I stoke my my my, my coals amongst the ash. And this guy is just, you know, you, you order mixed fish grill and he just starts throwing down sardines and carapau, which is like a horse mackerel. And then you get a tarada, the seam bream, the robayu, the, the sea bass. And to me, that's like the best eating, you know, uh, vino verde, green wine, and loads of grilled fish. And I yeah, am, that sounds I am the hap, hap, happiest man there is. Same with eating Persian food. or I, I, I've done road trips around Lebanon, Pakistan, India, um, South America, you know, because I'm... I want to see how the world feeds itself. I want to see how they flavor meat. You know, you go to Persia and India and they use yogurts to help marinate and tenderize and, and test their brine. And, you know, those impart, you know, flavors when you use lemon juices and things like that. You, it, it's wa watching how you get different meat properties. I mean, you, you, I always think meat is king. Beef is king. You shouldn't fuck with it. Um, and, you know, it's a savory thing, but here I am doing a bulgogi, you know, a, a, a Asian pear kind of sweet meat marinade, and, uh, the, and the Asian pears help tenderize the meat. And uh, and it, it was phenomenal, and I always think, you know, well, meat's supposed to be savory, but my friend was saying, I go, well, no, wait a minute, what about barbecue sauce? You know, it's, it's the classic. You put barbecue sauce on ribs, you put barbecue sauce on, on pulled pork, you know, um, on chicken, you know, and, and so sweets work just as well as savories and tangs. It's just, yeah. I just love learning all these ways that different countries do it. And I just think it just helps me with my, my barbecue and my cooking. And, um, 
it's just you the know, inspiration look, like you, you take in daily life if you're if you're traveling around your inspiration like everything around you is just constantly inspiring you i mean like all the street food that i encountered when when i was sort of traveling asia just like not not changed changed my taste buds forever it was just crazy like the sort of inspiration you get from these sort of places is just phenomenal yeah oh man you're lucky i haven't done the whole asia thing yet i want to do thailand and laos and vietnam and that's that's one i've been saving for myself oh some of the best honestly barbecue over there is is phenomenal it's fantastic all the sort of satays, sort of everything like that. All you, oh, it's fantastic. Well, then, then, then there you go. Satays, you know, peanut sauces. You know, you always think, you know, peanuts and meat. Because when I did a, a King burger, I did like a, a an Elvis Presley burger, and I did a jam and peanut butter on a burger, and everybody's like, that's disgusting. I'm like, dude, you, you eat satays, you know, it's it, it, that that's that's peanut a peanut based sauce, and um and meat. So why why won't you know, peanut butter on, on a beef burger work. And once you taste it, you're like, wow, that does work. You know, it, it, I always say, try it, you know, try it first. Don't start dissing it because you have preconceptions. You know, there's a reason why things happen. There's a reason why certain cultures do their food because it tastes good and it works, you know, and there's tenderization, there's brining, there's flavors. It's just, you know, a lot of people have bl- blinders on. I, I read it with, my, with with people that watch my videos, you know, oh, I hate Cory. I hate cilantro. It tastes like soap or coriander. Well, maybe you have that weird gene where it it, it, it makes coriander taste like soap. But I mean, to me, coriander is one of the best, freshest herbs going. You know, it just it transforms like any dish. Like yeah. a little bit of like just even a tiny bit of fresh coriander, like chucked on the end after you've cooked, mm. just like completely just changes the, yeah. the whole the whole the whole thing. Like completely changes. It's fantastic. Oh, just like fresh. even putting uh, the put the stems in your um chili when you're making a big chili con carne yeah you know throw a bunch of you know those, those stems are full of, of of flavor and everybody always just grabs the leaves but the stems are pers- they're super zesty and mm. you know, yeah i'm making a chimichurri Fresh. and i just chuck the whole mm. things in yeah whole things Fuck in yeah. it up like i'm not i'm not getting rid of any of that flavor and chuck it all in why not <laughs> yeah use it all man so in between all of this recipe development and the videos and stuff, do you have like a family favorite go-to cook that you're, you're always like, ah, oh, busy day, heading home, what, what are you going to chuck on the grill? Oh, okay, I'll give you the recipe that my father always has waiting for me when I go see him in America, and that's uh, his, uh, his flank steak. And it's basically, because he was buying grocery, flank, you know, skirt, you, you, you just, if, if you can't find any of those groups, go hanger. Go flat iron, go terrace major, which is like a, another muscle near the flat iron. That's um, you know it's got that kind of that, 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 that kind of muscle work, those kind of long you know flank kind of it looks like flank, but any kind of diaphragm belly or the shoulder stuff, terrace major and flat iron, those kind of muscles work really good for this recipe. And it's just a shitty cheap bottle of Italian dressing. So it's, you know, you've got your oil, olive oil, your, your peppers, your spices, and your vinegar. You've got your tang in there. And you just throw a bunch of flanks into a Ziploc bag and pour a bottle of Italian dressing in there and leave it in your fridge overnight. And then pull it out, you know, get all that oils and stuff off, and then grill it. And, you know, cut against the grain kind of on, a, on an angle. And to me, that with a, with a baked potato and, um, and a salad and an iced tea is the taste of home. So... Uh, I like doing that recipe, you know, and awesome. I don't, you, you could, you, the, the cheaper the Italian dressing, the better. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that way how food can just take you back memories and, and stuff like that. Food can really just take you somewhere and really just take you back to a moment or like really remind you of certain things. So that's awesome. Oh yeah. It, it's like, it's like muscle memory, eating memory, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, yeah, that, I think that's, that's the thing I, my dad always is waiting for me. And then if, if I'm cooking for friends, I don't know, man. I love doing a. I love showing people how to cook really good steak. You know, doing a good ribeye. Yeah. Do you, um, ever, do you ever cook dirty steak? Yeah, I do a lot of stuff dirty. I do a lot of my veg dirty. A lot of my root veg dirty. Um, I've done I've done steaks and lamb neck and stuff dirty. But um, you know, for the most part, I just I I, I throw loads of onions in the coals and then you know let them do their thing and then just cook you know work straight on the grill. You know, when it comes to steaks. Mm-hmm. I did see Josh Ozerski, who started Metopia, uh, take a big hunk of deckel and cook it straight on the grills. And, and that's one of the best things I've ever seen or tasted. 
Awesome. Because that, that deckle on the ribeye is, you know, one of the best best flavors because it's just surrounded by all that fat. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so smushy and just gorgeous when it hits that, when it has salt and just fire and it's cooked, you know, medium rare. So the fats break down around the deckle. That, that is going to be one of the best things you'll ever put in your mouth. Sounds so good. <laughs> um, Am I making you guys hungry? Yeah, this is what always happens on our podcast. Basically, we just sit here, we just speak about food for so long that we get so hungry, we have to just go and get food. <laughs> Not yet, though. So, can, okay. can we talk? A li- let's talk a little bit about um, the fact that you're DJ barbecue. So you're also a DJ. What what came first? Was it the DJ or the barbecue? <laughs> Bar- barbecue. Well, that's a good question. Barbecue came first because that was like age five. And I started, I got really into music when I was about 12. And then I started DJing when I was 18 at, um, at my fraternity house at the University of Maryland. And, um, and then I really went more into TV presenting and, and DJing. And I had a radio show at Kerrang Radio for five years. And um, I, I remember when the, the epiphany for DJ Barbecue came at a place called Rock Nest, which is on the banks of Loch Ness up in Scotland. And I was DJing in this really full tent. It was packed. It was, you know, loads of people outside. And girls are taking their tops off, you know, and everybody's half naked dancing in their bras. And I'm thinking, this is great. As I'm looking at this crowd, I'm thinking, what the hell am I going to do when I turn 50 or when I turn 60? You know, I'm I just be a bit weird to DJ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what I thought. I bring, a, I bring my love of barbecue, my love of DJing, and create this kind of catertainment experience and create a destination. So when people are hungry, you know, if I still want to have a good dance and a boogie, they can come over, you know, get a really good pulled pork sandwich, get a burger, you know, you know, get, get some, you know, carved beef leg and, and then have a dance. And then they, you know, we've got everything set up for them, you know, and that's, that's what we've been doing. I think last year I did nine weekends in a row, building, building a restaurant, building a, a Southern style juke joint and a full sound system and smoking meat for five days and then just DJing all day, all night and running around, you know, entertaining people, catertaining people. <laughs> and, uh, and then I think people remember you and they come back and every year we're, we're busier earlier in the festival, which is, a, I think, a testament to what we do. Yeah, awesome. I think when you, you think of like the ultimate party, there's always got to be a barbecue and like there. I mean, you always yeah. think of like awesome tunes, great beer, barbecue like that is like in in your mind when you think about the ultimate party it's always got to be there so you're mm. bringing the whole package all at once that's it i mean everybody everybody loves throwing parties everybody loves like guys hanging out by the barbecue with cold beer and pushing meat and and it's just a social thing and and then we just do it on a much bigger scale and we always partner up with bars and and um and cocktail bars at festivals so we'll open up like our our prep area and dj out the back end of it no, we don't. We don't want to DJ straight out to where we're serving because that just annoys people. We want to throw a party, but it's still part of us. But we also want to send it into like you know a bar area. So we always partner up and sit next to a good bar or a good cocktail place. And I remember the, we were at On Black Heath last year, and this guy I was I was doing a chef's club, and I kind of did some kind of posh barbecue with some venison and stuff. And this guy says to me, "We left Elbow's headline set because we heard you had a better party going on in your <laughs> cocktail bar." And, and it was, it was me and my main DJ, Johnny Boots, just doing a one-off, one, one-to-one battle. We did, we did like a, I think, 40 minutes of hip-hop, and then we went into just, you know, crazy, you know, one-hit wonder air guitar, rock and roll, and just, you know, I like to surprise people with songs and, you know, get them dancing to stuff they wouldn't expect to dance to. Like, I'll, I think at, at Girl Stock one year, I dropped, I dropped Slam Dunk the Funk by Five, and it just went nuts. I mean, people were saying the next day, I can't believe I was dancing to Five. In, in in the beer tent, but it was one of the funnest nights I've ever had, and I was drenched. And it was, you know, it's it's not playing the easy songs. I like I like kind of challenging people. Definitely, and we, I found out this just chatting to you before we started the show. That you actually DJed at my cousin's wedding and did a similar drop at that <laughs> wedding, I believe, as well. <laughs> the, the the four days. Well, it's, it's amazing. Your your cousin is. Um, is is world BMX dirt champion from what yeah, 2005 or something like that? Yeah. And then your other cousin, um, Leo, is one of the best woodworkers uh, in the world. He he and I have been talking about doing a uh, he makes hot tubs that are powered by wood. Yeah. But he wants to have a hot tub powered by a smoker barbecue. Yeah, that's what and I've been trying so, to convince him. I need to cook on it. <laughs> yeah. So we, 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 we I just got to bring a 
a crew down there and, and just and make some time to film that with uh, Leo because you've got some very talented uh, cousins there. Yeah, they are. They don't know what happened guys. to Ben. There. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just leading the way for them. <laughs> yeah, we were with, uh, with Steve and and uh, and Bobby from uh, Bloody Hell Hot Sauce at the Grill Stock launch night the other the other week. How was that? Because because my my uh, my DJ was the DJ there because I couldn't do it. It was Johnny Booth on the deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was awesome. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. He was night. pumping out the jeans all night, and uh, we we're doing shots of the Bloody Hell Hot Sauce with with Steve <laughs> and Bobby as well as uh, many uh -oh. other shots. It was it was a it was a great night. That that stuff is so good, man. That is a great hot sauce. Oh yeah, so much so much flavor with with heat. Which I know with a lot of sauces, hot sauces, you lose you lose flavor when you get hot, and and it's yeah. it shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't be you shouldn't hot be like flavor. yeah. You shouldn't be like take, losing flavor just to get heat. But his hot sauce has so much flavor, and you get the heat as well, which is it's awesome. I, I hope we can keep it up because I, I think small batch hot sauces are a really cool thing, and um. Um, and, and you can charge a premium for that. So all the work that he does, I think you can charge a premium. You know, I, I was looking at doing like barbecue sauce, but man, you can't charge a premium for like really good barbecue sauce, you, you know, cause it's so cheap out there. So I think, I think what he does, he, you know, serving in the glass skull, I think that's a really cool thing. Yeah. Those skulls are amazing, aren't they? Yeah. I got, a, I, I got them all lined up on my, uh, on my fireplace in my kitchen. Yeah. You pay the money just for the, for the jar, I reckon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then you throw a candle in it, and, you know, you got a cool little extra little token of your of your uh of your ass being on fire for the past couple of months. <laughs> so do you hey, if you guys want a really good uh dipping sauce, um go two tablespoons of Hellman's, a tablespoon of barbecue sauce, and a teaspoon of bloody hell hot sauce and whip that up and it's killer for like breads meats, uh, chips, uh, wedges. This is a really good dipping sauce. It's also a really good burger sauce. Yeah, that sounds lush. Yeah, awesome. I'll be writing yeah. that down using that one. <laughs> Super easy, man. You got a bit of the sweet from the barbecue sauce. You got a heat from the from uh, Bobby's Bloody Hell Hot Sauce, and you got that creaminess from the the Hellman's. Yeah. Have you, have you had any influence over the Hellman's barbecue sauces that they're releasing with this? Utopia, no, that was that was Neil Rankin. Neil Rankin oh, yeah. worked with them on those, so that was before I, I I was involved. So they they got some good people, you know. Neil Rankin's got to be one of my favorite chefs out there. Yeah, um, he he, he teaches well. All. Yeah, I went to the party the other night, man, and I was ruined for two days afterwards. <laughs> um, yeah, don't party with Gizzy. Uh, it was good, man. It was a good good launch. I think it's a really intelligent book, and it's he he really cares. He's quite scientific. Um, he's had a lot of great mentors to help him take his, you know, world because he, you know, he's probably, you know, trained, you know, French chef. Yeah. And now he's Mr. Live Fire smoking guy, and he's just he's got so much knowledge. Um, it's a it's a great book, and he's a great guy. Yeah, definitely. I haven't got the book yet, but I've definitely got to get it. But I'm, I've been ordering so many barbecue books recently that I've got to like, hide them in my car away from my wife so she doesn't see them all. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got about twenty five uh, books and I'm, and and that's just in this this pad and then I've got another like twenty five you know I have a lot of southern soul food stuff from where my mom's from Appalachia that kind of cooking um, and yeah I just don't, I'm running out of room plus I collect comic books so that's another one of my uh, little geeky things and I have a lot of vinyl so. Yeah, I need to start getting a bit more minimal with my life. <laughs> yeah, it's just it seems like all at once that there's so many barbecue books out right now mm. and, and so many awesome cookbooks coming out right now. You've got like, all the Hang Fire Girls, you've just had Grills Stop, you've got Neil Rankin's just dropped his, Ben Tish has just dropped his, and it's like there's so many good cookbooks out there. It's, it's awesome. I know. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get my second one going. So, you know, it's, it's a saturated market, but it's a good market. And I don't know. We we, we sold seventy thousand copies of our cookbook. I mean, I was really blown away. And even Penguin was. They're like, we're pretty blown away the, that a niche barbecue book like yours was able to sell so many. And I'm like, well, you know, it's just we try to keep it simple. We don't try to overcomplicate things. There are some ambitious recipes in there, but for the most part, you know, anybody can cook it. You know, yeah. you, you know, as long as you might have to give it some time, especially if you're doing. You know, like a you know a, a suckling pig, or if you're going to do a brisket. But other than that, a lot of those are very achievable, quick fire recipes and quick and easy sauces and marinades. 
so, so many more people are interested in in their food and interested in where it comes from and cooking and and it's it's a time when cookbooks and, and barbecues just absolutely smashing it out there because it's it's just so many people got the, just the bug friends love it yeah it's awesome i think it's a good time to be in in our world of barbecue and live fire cooking and if you can see it in the restaurants you know the proliferation of barbecue joints the proliferation of restaurants um putting in you know big argentinian tile type you know santa maria grills and you know it's you know it was ben tish that came i did a burger me and him judged the best burger in London for FHM, and he was telling me he was putting in a live fire grill in this new restaurant in, at Embers. And I was like, oh, okay, well, if you're doing that, if you want advice on that, you know, I got the guy. I talked to Mark Parr, and I introduced him to Mark Parr, and, you know, Mark helped him write his book. Mark, you know, now handles like over 200 restaurants. You know, Mark's a really – him and people like him and Matt Williams, those are those are like the coolest dudes I know. They're the they're, – they're bringing a whole another element of flavor to, to to the chef world, you know, through the notes of wood smoke, through charcoal properties, and you know, they're they're Renaissance men, really. Yeah, it was cool. That ben was talking about the, just the ways he, ways he brings in in smoke into his foods was was quite cool for me. Listening to him, where like he would like cold smoke things and. Rather than just like hot smoking everything, he'd he'd like yeah, cold smoke some butter that he'd then add into like a recipe later on and stuff. Yeah, so it's nice. like he wasn't yeah. always like it wasn't always that he's cooking with the smoke. He's it he was he was imparting smoke at all different levels and stuff. It was it was pretty cool hearing that from him. Yeah, Ben's a good guy, man. And it's funny because I want to do a, a jam with um with Gemma, the cupcake Gemma, and I was like, listen, I can cold smoke butter. I can cold because I'm always cold smoking like you know garlics and and lots of things and. Um, I was like, yeah, we can do a barbecue cupcake. You know, I mean, I can probably even cook a cupcake in my in my grill, but I think I'd rather just do give it, give the smoke properties to the sugars and butters and flours and and waters. We did a smoked uh, sourdough at at Camp Festival last year, so we smoked the water in my in the in the offset firebox kind of heat box on top of the Lang firebox, and we did that all night, and then we used that smoked water the sourdough and it was awesome yeah awesome that's like a lot of th- a lot yeah. of people are like smoking ice and stuff to get the smoke into cocktails yeah smoking ice smoking fruits you know um when i when i, I did a pop-up with uh and the bartenders kept giving me big racks of oranges and they can you throw these in your smoker for us and they were doing smoked oranges in the cocktails mm. yeah smoked yeah. lemons I think Ben even you were saying he smokes like dark chocolate as well. Yeah, so no, it was it was milk chocolate. Milk oh, chocolate milk. takes smoke on a lot better. He was yeah. saying, yeah, he's experimenting with like smoking like chocolate and stuff. So, mm. so yeah, there's some wow. awesome things you can do, especially with the dessert side of things as well. That's a really cool way of of getting smoke into into your desserts, which is awesome. My next door neighbor, yeah. she's really into baking like cakes and stuff, and she does them for people's birthdays and weddings. And the first day I'd got the pro cube back to my house. I was just cooking all sorts of different things, and she came out and she's just like, "I've got some cake batter left over. What do you fancy do it, trying it out?" So we just put that in and made some little cupcakes in the pro queue, and they came out perfectly. <laughs> nice, yeah, nice. Yeah, they were just for such a, like, a simple, basic recipe, it just tasted good. It just had a little hint of smoke on the outside, and that's all you really got from it. That's yeah. the key. Keep keep it simple, man. Yeah. I, my whole method is, I call it the KISS technique, you know, keep it simple, stupid. I don't want people to watch my videos and, and think, I can't do that. Um, you know, I want people to think, I can do that. I want people empowered, you know. I want them to get on a grill and not be afraid of live fire. Because, you know, that's why a lot of people get gas grills, because they want to be able to control that heat, um, which is cool. Um, but I just think if you're going to come outdoors, cook over real live fire, cook over charcoal, cook over wood. Yeah, um, I'm not, and I did learn to cook on a gas grill, so I'm not pissing them. But I just don't think you're going to get the flavors that you, the better flavors you can get off your own fresh charcoal or using, you know, wood sticks or wood smoke flavor properties on on your meat or your veg. No, definitely not. Us, we're all about that. All about the real fire, real coal, real wood. <laughs> yeah, nice. like, I'd rather have people outside cooking on a gas barbecue than than just cooking inside, but. <laughs> Still, again, I'd rather cooking on charcoal. So. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, if you've got the chimney flume, you know that that you know that metal tube that you know garden centers sell and Weber sell. Yeah. You throw your charcoal in there once, 
you are balled up, and you know, light that up. You've got you've got cooking fuel in ten minutes. Yeah. And and you know you don't have to wait forever. You know, and using loads of you know lighter fluid and all that. You just gotta use dry newspaper, and and you got a, you you got fuel and you're cooking in ten minutes. Yeah, I use mine in, in my house. I'm What's my, that? I'm my, I use mine in my lot in my house and my open fire. That's why I get my charcoal started now. Rather than rather than building a fire, I have my I have one of my chimneys inside, sat on like the the little bit on front of my fire. And I just fill it up with the charcoal, get my chimney chimney going, and then that's my fire sorted on the inside as well. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Yeah, it gets <laughs> to go in ten minutes. It. Don't drop it, carry it for your house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't carry it through. I light it like sat right on. I, I light it up, sat inside like the. Uh, like the fireplace, and just light it up, have the chimney sat there, burning away, then pour the coal straight into the fireplace, and I have a beautiful, 10 minutes, I have a beautiful fire going, (laughs) and uh, yeah. Man, smart. I mean, that's how we get our our firebox going. We don't don't use, I know a lot of like pit masters have that big gas kind of uh, flamethrower, or, you know, but I I just light up some charcoal in, in, in that chimney flume, and then that's how we get all our our, our, our lang's going. That simple technique. Yeah, we've even been cooking on them quite a bit recently. Really? Yeah, you get the the uh, chimney griller. Yeah, I did really? some steaks. Yeah. yeah, you get like it's like a I don't know, like a cast iron or like metal grill plate that sits directly on top of the uh, your chimney. So you uh, nice. you fill your chimney with charcoal and you get such an into like the heat the heat pumping out of that is like the caramelization on the outside of your steaks will never be the same again. Like the it's it's awesome, absolutely epic. Well, you know, I think it, that it's an important thing to use your your any heat source in the house to cook. And I think that's one thing we've lost is the old fireplaces that that houses had um, with all the hooks, and you know, you'd have the big pedal, the big kettles kind of boiling away, and stews cooking, and you know, broths and and soups, and you know, that that, that fireplace wasn't just for heat; it was for cooking. And and I'd like to see a lot of that come back. I mean, Francis Mailman, he you know he does that with his cooking. And I would love to kind of have a, an old house that still has the hooks in 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 the fireplace, and I can go back to that way of uh, cooking food indoors and keeping that smell indoors. Yeah, good friend of ours, Marcus uh, Marcus Bowden from Country Wood Smoke. He has a Marcus is amazing. Yeah, he cooks. He has one in his he has one in his lounge, and he cooks cooks food in it sometimes when he can't be bothered to go outside and and uh out to his outdoor kitchen he's laid on the sofa with some steaks going in a cast iron skillet over his uh fireplace which is awesome dude that's cool well i i think i think marcus runs um the best fan uh i think friendliest barbecue you know what, what do you call it the facebook page forum, he does, yeah, like a barbecue with, community forum. yeah yeah I think it's the friendliest, most welcomingest community out there, and I'm I'm really stoked that he's such a positive, friendly force in the barbecue world, and and uh, it, it couldn't be a better guy running it. And and I always direct people towards that forum if they want to be involved and not be afraid to ask questions, because you know that's what's so good is you know as soon as you go in there with a question, you know, can't there's no question stupid, because if you're a beginner, you need to you need to know, and that's the place best place to ask. I mean, you've got a great resource on youtube and all that but you know that it, it's a very welcoming community so i applaud marcus for starting that yeah i've been queuing for a few years now and i still get i still learn stuff from the forum from the cws country would smoke so forum all the time cool for anything really isn't it? yeah you get like say like you're having a problem like even mid cook you can put something on there and people will be like firing answers to you like mid cook so you can it's like real life like people will actually like come along for the cook with you sometimes yeah. it's pretty awesome yeah and like the so inspiration, they, they, want, they want to see photos, don't they? Like, come on, set, put photos up. I want to see what it looks like. You know, did did we save it? Did you get through the meat stall? It's such an epic form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, I love it. And like I said, yeah. it inspires me. Like, it's one of the things that through the week I, I see people posting stuff or asking questions, and I think, yeah, well, he's asked that question. I'll do a little cook at the weekend to show him how it's done and and post it back to him, and 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 hopefully, like, maybe able to pass some knowledge on and some of the stuff that I probably learned from someone else in the forum, which is really cool. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I just was going on the Facebook now and, you know, Steve Hayes. Yeah. You know, the guy who does, <laughs> and his post, he, he's there in, in pantyhose and heels. It's just a photo of his feet in, in these like three inch heels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you know, he 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 he, he he's like the Eddie Izzard of uh, the barbecue yeah, world. He's, and, he's <laughs> rad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had such a good night. Honestly, the grill stock launch night was awesome. We we were in uh, Paddington. We arrived in Paddington. We met these uh, these awesome guys who are running Shine London. Have you heard of them? They're the Moonshine guys in London at the moment, and they're uh, okay. they're knocking out some awesome moonshine. And we were we met them in in a. Uh, at Paddington, they met us off the train with some moonshine, and we uh, we started drinking moonshine in the Paddington station. We were walking up towards the, the overground station, and then we saw Ed and Emma from Bunch of Swines, and uh, they were like they were waving over at us. We bumped into them, and then Steve Hayes was there, and we all jumped in an Uber and, and arrived at, at Grillstock and just got on it, <laughs> ate copious amounts of barbecue food, and had an absolute wicked time. It was brilliant. And Charlie from uh, Smoking Penguins turned up, and it was it was an awesome night. Such a good night. Good, good, good people, man. There was like three book launch parties that night as well, man. So it was, yeah. like, it was, it was, it was the night for book launches. Yeah, the was... whole week was full of book launch parties. Yeah, Ben had one. Ben Tishes was the Day night before, before that. Yeah, yeah, because he invited yep. us up for that one. We'd already booked our, we'd already booked our train up and back for the Tuesday. Then he invited us up on the Monday, and we were like, oh, we just couldn't, like, we couldn't do it. So we were just like, we were gutted to be honest. But that would have been an awesome night as well. Where, where are you guys based? Right down in the southwest, we're based down in Plymouth. Okay. Yeah, deep, deep, deep dark Devon. We're down here. <laughs> nice. Yes, it's awesome down here, yeah. Right, we are at the hour mark, so I am going to have to call it a day. Sadly. Okay. Sadly. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming on, mate. No worries. I'll back and talk to you, much. Definitely no, not. <laughs> no, awesome. It's been absolutely great chatting to you. The hour's absolutely flown by. Could you, did, I know did, most people did you are going to... Did you get all the questions you wanted to ask? Because I, I feel like I didn't let you guys ask any questions. I just talked. That's all right. That's all we like to do. We yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just like listening. I mean, by the way, why does anyone want to listen to us? And we, we, just, yeah. like, we just like listening to you guys. <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We've recorded yet another awesome podcast to get you over hump day. As always, we are brought to you by ProQ Barbecue Gourmet and Smoke with Chuck, our Awesome sponsors. ProQ is dedicated to providing you with quality smoking products with top-notch service and free advice for beginners to pit masters. And you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under ProQ Smokers. So if you're thinking about buying your first smoker or looking to upgrade or even looking to pick up some epic accessories, check them out over at Max Barbecue. Barbecue Gourmet is devoted to promoting real barbecue and supplying the UK and Europe with top championship winning barbecue rubs, sauces, marinades, and accessories from the US and around the world. And you can find them on Twitter and online under Barbecue Gourmet. So regardless of how you cook, whether it's on charcoal, wood, gas, or electric, the real taste of barbecue can be yours all year round. And Smokewood Shack delivers quality smoking wood every time. They provide the smoking goodness, you provide the talent. So if you're looking for smoking wood chunks, dust, chips, or planks, then head on over to smokewoodshack.com and you can find them on Twitter at Smokewood Shack. So goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Ciao. Bye.